So, Mycoremediation Demystified. That title is, of course, a play on words of David Aurora's um, Mushrooms Demystified, which is a popular book. If you didn't get the joke, that's, that's the uh, kicker there. And that's not a real mushroom, but it's a cute little Photoshop of one mushroom, which is quite good at uh, breaking down oil. Uh, this is Hypholoma fasciculare. Uh, they have some nice neon yellow gills and you'll, you'll see them out and about, I'm sure. So the focus of tonight's talk is going to be industry, like the uh, field of bioremediation that is, the ecology of fungi, it's why they're doing this, and the flim flam. Uh, for those of you who have heard about this field, it's, uh, it's exciting. It can be borderline sensational at times, but not without reason. So I hope to uh, separate some of the excitement from the idealism and uh, give you a little bit of a better picture of what's going on here. If you have any questions, you can type them in the chat um, and you can also go ahead and send them to Lauren Ray if you feel more comfortable doing it that way. Uh, I also will stop for questions pretty regularly and don't hesitate because this is it, there's a lot to the presentation. So. Without much more to do, here we are. Microremediation can be defined in industry, it can be defined in ecology, and it can be defined for the layperson. And I want you all just to focus on that right definition here. If you've already become familiar with microremediation, you can look at the other two, but for the layperson, microremediation is cultivating a fungus and using it to break down toxic waste or bacteria and restore dirty soil and water. It's cleaning up soil, cleaning up pollution. It's what got me into this whole field. And it's the thought that you can take some oil, put it on some straw and grow yourself some oyster mushrooms. Um, these pictures are Paul Stamets and he wrote the book that got me into this field. And I have uh, much thanks to him for doing that. Um, you can also take small operations like this and scale them up into polluted piles of, of oil like this. And ideally, if it goes well, you end up with restored soil. So instead of having to scoop things out, move it around, burn things, which are commonplace uh, methods and other branches of remediation, you can leave everything where it is and inoculate it with fungi. Um, the goal of course, with this is to break everything down just to natural elements. And it should be asterisk when you read about oil being broken down by oyster mushrooms, that 2% is the concentration that it really caps out. Over 2% oil in the soil, the oyster mushrooms don't tend to survive long term. Uh, of course, there are exceptions. And those numbers might change as we get uh, more advanced with our understanding of fungal ecology. Um, but 2% is not trivial. I mean, this pile that you saw right here, that's not normal soil and that's around 2%. So moving along. Uh, another picture, it might look like this. Mycoremediation might look like filling some burlap sacks with straw that has oyster mushrooms growing through them and using it as a filter. The wonderful thing about fungus being sponges in the soil that function to hold moisture in is they're also good as like sponges in your sink and filtering things through them. And in this situation, uh, storm water can be treated. Um, say the storm water has collected a bunch of silt and sediments, you know, the first rain of the seasons, washed oils off of the streets. And these fungi here can collect and break down those oil. I think out of a lot of the mechanisms out there to use microremediation, this one's just so elegant and simple. You know, uh, there are people who study this at universities, uh, but really anybody can understand you're growing fungi, putting them in a stream. And uh, the beauty is that it works a lot of the time. So there's obviously a need for techniques to be developed to clean up pollution. Um, Superfund sites are sites classified by the EPA to be so polluted as to warrant special attention and money. 
Um, in the United States, there's over 1,300 of these sites and another 450,000 sites known as brownfields, which are less polluted than a Superfund site, but uh, still notably polluted. Um, of that $8.2 billion budget, I think about half of it, about four and a half or five billion has been spent cleaning up wastes. Anyone have any questions at this point? I'm going a little fast, but I want to be able to get to the good stuff. Not in the chat. Down in the chat. No, none, none are. Oh, none in the chat. Good to know. Again, don't hesitate. Um, so yeah, some of these super fun sites close to where I got my undergrad were these three. Um, uh, a couple transformers had exploded at two sites which managed power grids and then a creosote plant which made all of the telephone poles for the city had polluted their areas sufficiently enough around their um, around their factories as to warrant uh, special funding. And of these, all two of them are cleaned up very well and the Oser site is still being worked on. Um, creosote is, is a very nasty blend of a whole bunch of different toxins and it's especially gross in terms of uh, not many things break it down, but there is a mushroom known as Neolentinus lepidius, the train wrecker mushroom that can eat creosote. And I'm hoping to do some work in the next year, doing some trials on creosote poles for the uh, Environmental Protection Agency. As of now, there's a program that goes around the beaches and parks and finds old creosote laden logs that have washed ashore and they pick them up and they bring them somewhere. And I found these, this group of people doing this and I asked them, well, what do you guys do with the creosote poles? And they just, they sit in a pile somewhere. So uh, we got to find ways to break things down. Um, obviously it's needed. Um, and when someone finds polluted sites, they have a pre-remediation process that looks a little bit like this. They do some background research, getting to know the layout of the site. They'll do a survey for what wildlife is there and possibly what things have been impacted. A lot of lichen species can go away if your air is polluted and biodiversity in the soil tends to decrease as you have soil pollutants. And you can have this much fun doing it. Apparently these guys, these, these two were having a blast. And then there's risk assessment, which is a computational process. Um, and a lot of, very few people in that industry even are a part of that actual process. Um, computer science plays a big role here. So once the uh, site has been assessed, if it has been determined to be a super fun site or a site that needs remediation, there are three ways typically that this can happen. Um, somebody is found to be liable, a company, uh, in there's, there's organizations that are entirely devoted to finding out who's liable to clean things up and their environmental forensics groups. Uh, and once that person has the blame pinned on them, they will either go through a process of taking bids from companies who want to clean up their site, or legally the government will mandate, especially if there are uh, mixed contaminants and uh, high degrees of pollution, they'll mandate certain procedures to be done to, clean, to be cleaned up. So uh, companies can bid, the government can decide, or very rarely people can vote on who is going to clean up a site and how they're going to do it. And I think that's a really neat thing. Um, if the company made the problem, the people around the pollution affected by it should be able to make the decision. Uh, the Willamette River down in Portland, the Port of Portland had a polluted site that they put to a vote. To the, they gave the people a vote. Who's, how are we going to clean this up? And that was one of the only instances I'm aware of where microremediation was publicly decided to be the uh, route that they wanted to try out first. And those trials ended uh, four or five months ago with some mixed results and some success. But the more data we gather, the better in that front. So as far as what they can remediate, when it comes to chemicals, it's a long list. And you don't have to know what all of these are. Uh, the point of this talk isn't to educate you on the nuance, but to give you an idea of where the field's at. Um, so everything from TNT, 
to diesel spills, to old pesticides um, can be cleaned up potentially by fungi or helped to be cleaned up by fungi. And um, the asterisk one I have there is PFAS compounds. And if you haven't heard about those, I'll get to them a little later. They uh, require some special attention. Uh, the site at the Willamette was polluted with PFAS compounds and the fungi had some success breaking them down. Um, so the first bit there, those are the chemicals that can be broken down. Here are some metals. And it's good to point out chemicals can be broken down into smaller constituents, but the individual atoms of metals don't ever go away, right? You don't destroy an atom. And so what fungi do is they hyperaccumulate. And it's good to distinguish hyperaccumulation does not equal degradation. The metals are still somewhere, but they're isolated into the fungi, concentrated into the fungi in a fashion that allows for them to be collected. On the bottom left there, you have some fried chicken mushroom, Lyophyllum decastes. And those I believe are, are efficient at collecting nickel is their first metal they're very good at. And all the different mushrooms out there will have selective ways they accumulate metals. Um, those ones prefer to shove nickel up into their fruit bodies. Uh, Tom Volk once said, he's a professor over in, um, gosh, University of Wisconsin, I believe that the, the fungi sort of use their fruiting bodies as a dumpster in that way. If there are too many metals in the soil, they will shove the excess up and out of the environment they live in. A chat question there. What if you eat one? That's a great question. So when you're talking about fungi breaking things down, the idea is that it'll be broken down into completely inert things. Um, that is that it'd be safe to eat but with metals, since they don't go away, if you eat a chicken, fried chicken mushroom that's growing in a, an area where there's nickel in the soil, you can have some metal poisoning. And it's good to be aware of that. If you're foraging near harbors, near um, old farms where they used a lot of pesticides, uh, to be wary of what you put in your body. Uh, I personally don't try to eat mushrooms that are in areas that are questionable. Um, it's good to, it's good to think too, that these studies of micromediation aren't looking to see, are the mushrooms safe to eat? They're looking to see, do the mushrooms break things down or pull them out of the soil? So that's small distinguishing factor. There might be hundreds of studies saying that fungi break things down, but those studies very, very rarely focus on if you can eat things. So, um, if you eat one of those lyophyllum growing uh, in a polluted area, you might have an upset stomach. On the bottom right is an aspergillus mold, and molds actually tend to be the more efficient collectors of metals um, in research settings, at least, because they are easier to control. They are um, they have a much easier time having water pass through them and having metals ad adsorb. So different than absorb, going into adsorb on top of the molds. Um, and they've, they've, people have been breeding molds to absorb and handle crazy amounts of metals. But if you go to any old mine near where you live, odds are there's some molds there that have become quite resistant to metals. And my slides, there we go. And it, something to note too, not all metals are equally toxic. On the left here, you have mercury in its natural inorganic form. That form doesn't pass through the blood brain barrier. So when you hear about metals getting into the body uh, or eating some tuna and being concerned about heavy metals getting into your bloodstream, uh, that form of metals of metal passes through you. What you should be concerned of or know is that metals that are bond to carbon atoms, methylmercury here and ethylmercury, are the ones which are more bioaccessible. And so that silver ball is just blopped onto a carbon atom with three hydrogens. And uh, the cycling of inorganic metals with organic metals happens a lot at the interfaces of water and soil in the muck at the bottom of pools and sediment or at the top of the uh, soil where films form. Um, and some endophytes and fun endophytic fungi, fungi living inside of other creatures, can deactivate those forms of metals. Um, and 
it is not as straightforward as it sounds, you know. That lyophilum that I just showed you may have absorbed uh, nickel into its fruit body, but it's very, the fungi are very selective. So here's an article with a chart. You don't have to read it all, but this article, this chart just illustrates that the mycelial body of the fungus accumulates different metals. Then does the mycelial body, or then does the fruit, I mean. So the mycelium under the soil will select out different metals than the fruit above. And even just preparing the uh, fruit bodies, if you dehydrate them, sun-dried or oven-dried, they will select for different metals a lot of the time. Um, for instance, you can see here that mycelia select for an entire different, or some of the similar metals, but different metals than the fruiting bodies. So if you've heard before that fungi can pull heavy metals out of the soil, just know it's more dynamic than it appears. Uh, different parts of fungi pull out different metals and species will have specific metals they favor. So a few other things they can remediate. Uh, antibiotic resistance genes. If you have a soil where fungi are growing and bacteria are present, the bacteria will have more competition if there are fungi in the soil and any soil generally with good competition will slowly breed out antibiotic resistance genes, which you may have heard of as things to worry about in our hospitals and with the use of antibiotics. Um, e. coli and fecal coliforms from um, livestock operations can be filtered out, as I showed before, and uh, nematodes can be controlled by nematode-catching fungi. Uh, that's a whole fun ecology there uh, and an old, old evolutionary history, about 550 million years of nematodes and fungi hanging out in the soil. So what gives? If fungi can do all of these things, we've heard about it. Why hasn't it taken off? That's the question that I had when I really got into this. Uh, truthfully, it's an idea ahead of the science. And uh, this year's Paul Stamets, and it's good to remember he wrote how mushrooms can help save the world, not help save humanity and not do it all by themselves. Um, certainly, if we make a mess, fungi will clean it up. But on our time scale and in the way we want, that's, to be, that's uh, a little bit much to ask. Um, a quote here sort of summarizes where the field's at. Uh, this is by Peter McCoy. And he's saying that if we develop anecdotal evidence for certain common pollution scenarios, we'll be able to build protocols from re micro remediation, but we're just not there yet. And that is true. There's just a lot of inconsistencies in since all of these pollution scenarios can be so different. Um, and how I started asking this question, what gives, was I was given an article showing how molds can pull heavy metals out of water. And I thought, well, great, here's the answer. Let's go for it. Um, I also had seen an article about how fungi can be used to make styrofoam. And I don't like styrofoam. It never goes away. On the right here are the graphs from that first article I saw. And it's been uh, 10 years. Wow of me wondering about uh, why fungi haven't yet eaten all of our garbage. Um, a few years in, I got into a research program at Western Washington University that focused on biodegradable plastic mulches. So these are sheets used to cover farms and they're advertised as biodegradable and they tended to harbor Aspergillus fungi, which is uh, a problem because some of those Aspergillus fungi produced very potent toxins called aflatoxin that can get onto the fruit. And so my professor was studying and I was studying how biodegradable plastic mulches affect the fungi that they work with. And to sum up all of the findings, um, and on the right here, that's a piece of a biodegradable plastic mulch being broken down. Um, to sum up all the findings, the fungi aren't there because they really like the taste and the flavor, and it's a good place for them to be growing on these biodegradable plastic mulches, mulches. These molds are just there because they're the only things that can tolerate these acidic pieces that ooze off of biodegradable plastic mulches. Um, it's a big problem. It's a big industry. 
Uh, and so that's where I really started to find how interdisciplinary this field is. And it, it is extremely interdisciplinary. There's a reason, one of the biggest reasons it hasn't taken off is because it is in the center of so many different fields. Um, as you can see here, it's got chemistry, toxicology, environmental science, biology, and that computer work all built into one part and parcel. If you're trying to study how do fungi break things down, you need all of these minds and all of these tools looking. Um, and just a quick definition there, because uh, I glazed over the definitions earlier. Bioremediation, micromediation is a specific type of bioremediation. And bioremediation is the use of naturally occurring or deliberately introduced microorganisms to break down uh, environmental pollutants in order to clean up a pollutant, polluted site. Any questions? Anybody have anything cooking in their head? I've heard all of these names, biogeochemistry, environmental bio microbiology. Uh, it's hard to put a finger on what bioremediation is. There are programs that study uh, very closely bioremediation, uh, one being in Portland at the uh, Superfund research program they have there, and another few in the Netherlands that I can't remember the names of those colleges, but there's a few places on earth where they're focused on incorporating all these things. Um, and then after that lab work, I got a small gig with the National Science Foundation in a program called i Teams. And this program was one where I had an idea and they said, sure, it sounds all right. My idea was to uh, try and start making a protocol by which we could learn from micro microremediation mistakes and failures and make that off the shelf uh, recipe that Peter McCoy was sort of describing. And I interviewed 50 different researchers and companies. And what shocked me was there wasn't, I expected, especially with Shell and Chevron, people to say, we, we aren't interested. Uh, is it, the opposite is true. These companies would love to have the great PR of saying, we're here to use microremediation if it was reliable enough for them to do it at scale. Uh, and there have been great successes on big sites, such as the Macaw Indian Nation up here. Um, they've had some good successes and good failures um, at their Superfund site known as the Warmhouse Beach Dump. Um, that was a site where Paul Stamets originally went in and was trying to cultivate his salt water resistant strain of oyster mushrooms. And uh, his oyster mushrooms died. And another company came in and uh, did some more work with many different strains of mushrooms and they've had mixed success. Um, what's very encouraging to me is that the groups of people most interested um, in microremediation becoming an industrial practice are the tribes of the Pacific Northwest and then a few scientific companies and government agencies, uh, NASA being one of them. Um, some of the most successful larger scale microremediation cleanups have happened in tribal sites near Bristol Bay, Alaska, where uh, military bases have spilled fuel and fungi have been able to do some work cleaning them up. Um, so moving past this project, it was absolutely mystifying just to see how big this industry was. And the themes I got from all these employees, I talked to people at every step of the process and everybody complained it was too bureaucratic, too slow. They all got into the environmental sector wanting to clean things up, make a difference. And they would spend five years deciding how to do that at one location. Um, or that's, that's a hyperbole, sometimes five years, but very regularly two, three years at a given site. Um, there's no centralized database to learn from remediation projects. This was a problem I ran into um, saying that, as I mentioned, companies would like to use microremediation, but they just don't see the evidence in a big enough form, in any centralized form. Um, I did find one cryptic database that the government organized called the Federal, Federal Roundtable of Remediation. And all of the government's uh, experiments have been compiled there. Uh, very odd site. 
And another biggest issue is that people want to do the least amount of work for the least amount of money. If the EPA says you can have 200 parts per million of oil in your soil here, or you could have 400 if you put concrete on top of it, a lot of situations they're going to do the least. They're going to cap the site by putting concrete over it, or they're going to, you know, uh, move things. That's another reason. It's, it's easier just to scoop out the problem and move it sometimes. It might be quite expensive, but um, there's not always the motivation. Uh, one interesting site in Alaska where they wanted to move all the pollutants out, but it was too far removed from any site to incinerate it. Um, someone came up with the ingenious idea that they could scoop it all up in some tractors and drive it up a mountainside until it froze. And I can't recall where that was. It was on the Aleutian somewhere, but uh, they, that's what they did in that situation. Instead of looking at how can we break these compounds down, they just drove it up the mountain until it froze. And here's exactly how bureaucratic it is. This is a, a graph showing all of the pieces of a cleanup operation. And right down there, that green circle, that's the place where micro-remediation could fit in. And that's if you've decided to keep the soil there and you've decided you want to clean it up using uh, organisms other than the ones that are, uh, you wanna clean it up using organisms that you'd bring in such as fungi or plants. And uh, it's, it's definitely a lot of tactics. Like once you get to that in situ remediation, there are all of these different ways you could go about it. Um, at the top there, that's ex situ, that's scraping things out. So we'll get rid of that. And you're left with in situ, which is leaving it there. Natural attenuation being stimulating the, or letting the microbes there break things down over time. And that is a very popular choice. Um, if the pollutants are buried too deep, uh, a lot of times bacteria in the soil growing that deep are the only things that will get there in any reasonable amount of time. And then there are all of these enhanced approaches which involve pumping gases and, and such into the uh, soil column to stimulate different microbes. And then microremediation hangs out on the corner there next to phyto phytoremediation. It's an underdog. Um, on this pie chart here, you can see that only 9% of uh, cleanup operations might involve microremediation. This is the best graph I could find to try and quantify how often it's used in industry. And my guess would be that about 1% or a half of a percent of cleanup oper operations um, end up using microremediation at all. Of course, it's good to mention that there are fungi there in the soil, even if they aren't trying to breed them. Um, and that's one of the fallacies with talking about remediation and sort of the flim flam, as you will. Um, in any given site, you're never just using one organism. If there are bacteria, there are many species of bacteria. If you put in plants, well, you're bringing in something that selects for different bacteria. If you put in fungi, they're also exerting a force and selecting for bacteria in the soil. Um, and you can see with the usage of literature here that right around the time the EPA started enforcing the Clean Air and Water Act, uh, bioremediation and phytoremediation blew up in the literature, but microremediation slow going. Uh, I think just a few years after uh, mycelium running came out, we started to see an uptick, but it's by far an underdog. Um, and in those cleanup sites and failures with microremediation that I have observed, there are simple things over overlooked. When you're sampling a site, it's really easy not to sample in a grid that is so, uh, it's really easy not to know exactly how toxic things are. Because not everything's spread out equally. In a perfect world, we'd be able to say what toxins are where, but that's one of the biggest challenges in the pre-remediation. Um, the depth of pollutant to know how far down it goes. Uh, with fungi, they don't tend to grow more than a foot or so under the surface. So if your pollutants are very deep, fungi are not the ideal way to go about cleaning things up. Um, and then the other problem I've seen is people just taking the literature out of context. 
there's a lot of hype and people mentioning, well, you can break down oil with oyster mushrooms. But as I mentioned, 2% concentration of oil in soil. Um, yeah, there's a question. Um, is there a way to find or buy plugs if one has microremediation to do at home? We have some buried railroad ties and I would love to mitigate any pollutants. Uh, I don't know of anybody that sells plugs per se. There is definitely um, a little bit more of a process into how you evaluate what fungi you'd like to use. Uh, with railroad ties, they're likely covered in creosote. And so uh, there's already a species known to break that down. Um, the answer to your question is, I don't know. I don't know if there's a specific place where you could find uh, plugs but I could tell you that for railroad ties, the species you want is called the train wrecker or Neolentinus lepidius. And um, if you want to get my email at the end of this, we can stay in touch because I'm, I'm hopefully going to be doing some work with that mushroom on railroad ties and uh, telephone poles. Okie dokie. So, as well as easy problems that are overlooked, there are nuanced problems easily missed. Um, you might not have enough going on in the soil to stimulate the fungi into breaking things down. Uh, these failures that I've seen, a lot of times people will have run trials and they will select for strains of fungi that seem to break down the pollutants they'd have. And it's not for a lack of trying that these things fail. Uh, but there's a lot of information and it's easy to overlook. Perhaps there aren't bacteria in the soil that fungi need to have good competition to produce, um, to produce what they need to break things down. And I'll get into that a little bit further. Um, understanding the ecology is what the second one breaks down there too. Uh, basically, where we're at with microremediation is we've learned there might be a human use and we've taken it a bit out of context. And the ecology is, is something that all the time seems to be uh, what we need to learn more of. Um, genetics and epigenetic anomalies, I'll, I'll get to that in a little bit. And then I mentioned the soils may not be equally mixed. Uh, could you put that scientific name in the chat? Train wrecker. Yes, uh, Lauren will do it. That way I don't have to think about if I'm spelling it correctly. Um, so as I was saying, there needs to be competition in the soil. This is a thing, this is a picture of what is known in biology as dioxic growth. If you have two bacteria and both of them can eat lactose, or pardon me, both of them can eat glucose, but one can also eat lactose. If this one that can also eat lactose doesn't have any competition, it'll just eat the easiest food possible. Take the path of least resistance and eat the glucose. In this graph here, you can see that in the middle, once another bacteria has been introduced that also eats glucose, this first bacteria shifts its game plan to break down a bigger molecule. And with fungi, that's the case. Having some bacteria in the soil stimulates their production of enzymes that break down bigger, bigger molecules. Uh, those, are being called, those being lignolytic, lignin-degrading enzymes. Another simple insight, um, and this one is applicable for anybody who's cultivating fungi, not even for microremediation. Um, there are molecules that stimulate the metabolism of fungi. And these are widespread and they're things you can find in nature and often in your compost. Um, with fungi, we're not even at the place where it's common knowledge what helps them grow. With plants, uh, most everybody could list off here are a few things plants need to grow. You need some phosphorus and nitrogen, et cetera. But with fungi, it's, uh, we're not there in our cultural awareness. And this, this chart blows my mind. Uh, how many people have seen oyster mushrooms? How many people have grown oyster mushrooms without knowing, well, I could take my banana peels and grind them up and put them mixed into my substrate and it would make the oyster mushrooms absolutely explode with growth. Um, it's, it's an interesting thing. And in microremediation, it's something to consider uh, because you are looking for what can I pair with a fungus to make a more robust 
uh, metabolism for that fungus. In the chat here, we have Lauren Ray repping Trad Cotter. Trad Cotter has a great book um, and she's right in recommending it. I'll mention him a little later on. Uh, this, as far as a one, one off slide, this is a lot of information as to how to grow fungi. Um, and it's widespread, not just in these species listed here, but uh, you can look online. Well, I, I've looked online and there are a lot of similarities in the enzymes between wood decaying fungi and a lot of good reason to believe that barley, bran, banana waste, orange peels are things that can really bolster the metabolism of fungi. Um, you know what? This slide, so many words. I'm gonna just, I'm gonna skip it. I think I'm gonna say that these are again these issues. I have a lot to get through, so I don't want to just keep bogging down at the beginning. Um, a lot of these issues, I believe, could be mitigated and learned if we took pieces, took um, soil samples at these sites where people are doing microremediation, and we learned more about what genes are being turned on and off, and the timing of that. Um, that was my idea that I studied with uh, the National Science Foundation. I wanted to see if we could start cataloging the transcriptomics, the genomics of microremediation and make a, a library, at least to mitigate or understand failures. Uh, and it, at this point, it's good to mention, just like I said, with plants, we know what there is to grow or what, what is needed to grow. There's a huge gap and in cultural awareness um, and, and gap in the science and the industry of microremediation. Uh, while there are 4,000 papers mentioning microremediation since 1990, the techniques people use for bioremediation haven't changed much since then. And that's something I surmised from a lot of interviews. Um, I will say that we are hyper-focused on big scale things. When we hear about microremediation, it's how can they clean up oil spills? How can they clean up huge polluted areas? When in reality, there's so many applications at home and on small scale that might be more feasible and are a great place to start bridging that gap of cultural awareness. Um, yeah, everything here points, points to a need for more fundamental knowledge. Some of these smaller applications being chicken coops, Trad Cotter, it, his book, uh, Microremediation, uh, what is it? Microremediation and microfiltration, perhaps. We'll, we'll link that into the chat. He has a great setup of how you can have the best smelling chicken coops in your neighborhood. And you can make a small mesh layered with some wood chips and then some straw with Strafaria rugosa annulata, your wine caps growing underneath them. And the fungi being there will prevent a buildup of bacteria and make a safer area for your chickens and an easier one to sniff as you walk by it. Um, in the middle there, that's Neolentius lepidius. Um, and it's growing on what looks like a treated pole. Uh, and like this person who commented earlier, it's very, very possible that you could inoculate a log in, on your property if you have land with creosote polluted logs and do some cleaning. Um, another smaller, but a little bit bigger use would be if you're looking into buying land and you know it's been treated with pesticides, uh, you can treat the land in a way to grow the fungi. And by that, I would mean, if you know you have a big place of land where bad pesticides were used, you could try and inoculate that land to some capacity with some local fungi, and then just water it a few times in the, in the uh, spring, keep it from getting too dry. Um, that particular method hasn't been done at any scale I know of, but it's, it seems feasible. That's one where I, I don't think it's out of the scale um, to imagine, too much scale to imagine. Another couple small applications, nematode control. Um, the, right there is a picture of fungi lassoing nematodes out of soil. And it's a beautiful picture. And I actually, I should have given photo credit for that. That's a 
very stunning picture and you can see the hyphae have made little loops that the nematodes have swum through and they have captured them and they'll eat them for their nitrogen. Bio beds. You can feasibly make a small bioremediation setup to supplement a sewage waste treatment, or if you're a small company, to supplement your water waste. Uh, this is something that I see. There's no reason why this isn't, hasn't happened other than people don't know it's an option uh, because there's so much lab study and you can control the temperature and the environments of bio beds rather well. And uh, people implicate or implement also plants and biochar in these bio beds. And I think it, those are something that I would be hard pressed to see not taking off. I mean, if, if public awareness is there, I would love to see that become more of a commonplace thing. So why fungi? Uh, this slide has a lot of words and I'm going to just say that if you are not a scientist, just read the bold ones. Osmotrophy, they chew their food and then they swallow. So they release a bunch of enzymes into the soil and those enzymes happened to evolve to break down plant material, but they work on other things. They work <clears throat> on a wide array of pollutants. Uh, fungal enzymes are the show pony and there is thousand, easy, easily a thousand of them uh, secreted just in one fungus. And uh, the fact that we know that is remarkable. Uh, there have been some cool studies. And then the physical characteristics, they are sponges. So they're quite good at absorbing water and having metals coagulate around them. And uh, hydrolysis, some of these enzymes are hydrolytic and that just is the opposite of dehydration. So they add in a water molecule there and as you can see in the bottom right, break up some material. Why fungi when it comes to hyperaccumulation of heavy metals? Um, so on the right there is the picture of a fungus. It's not what you think of often, but that's the majority of a fungus is a mycelium spreading underneath a soil column. I have a question that's come in. Okay, what do we do with the fruiting bodies? Uh, yeah, that's a great question. Uh, if you do, if you pick them, where do they go? At that point, they tend to just be collected and stored somewhere. Um, and there are treatments to detoxify in a way the heavy metals to, to make them inorganic rather than organically available, rather than something that can pass the blood brain barrier. Um, I don't have the best answer to that question. It's not an ideal situation because also to your point, Jeff, um, a lot of the metals absorb into the mycelium. Um, what you can do is you can scoop out the metals and there are ways to sift out the mycelium and then leave the soil in place. Uh, but at, at that capacity, usually still the, the fruit material is growing or the vegetative material is going to a waste facility. Um, ultimately, it's still a win because it costs a fraction of what it would to scrape everything out. And in my eyes, you know, if you can leave the soil there, you're disturbing the least. Um, so fungi hyperaccumulate metals for some interesting ecology reasons. Um, they do it because secreted acids that they have allow them to cluster metals and they can weave their mycelium around these clusters of metals. Um, they are more resilient when it comes to heavy metals and soils than bacteria. So if, if there are a bunch of heavy metals, they have more uh, say in that environment, if you will. They're going to be able to colonize that soil and move around much more efficiently than the bacteria there. Um, heavy metals can disrupt carbon fixation, which is one reason why a fungus that pairs with a plant might want to make sure there aren't metals in the environment. Um, it's keeping that their plant host safe. Um, and then I think I have three more, oh, good old, four more reasons there. Um, so again, adsorb versus absorb. Um, fungi adsorb heavy metals onto their surface, but they also absorb them. And it's speculated that they shuttle these heavy metals 
with big vacuoles similar to vacuoles in a plant cell. And that's how they move the metals up into their fruit bodies. Uh, another thing to know is that fungi like to control their microbiome around them. So the microbiome in the soil, uh, when metals are there, shifts towards a different profile of bacteria. And it's, there's a lot of complexity, so I don't want to make any broad sweeping statements, but it's not too much to say that if the fungi can remove those metals or concentrate them, they'll be able to have a better control over their soil microbiome. Um, and more to the point, uh, the enzymes they use to break things down very frequently are uh, dependent on charge. They use a manganese ion a lot of times. And the heavy metals it inhibit their ability to digest their food. So all of these reasons form ecological motivations for fungi to evolve into things that will hyperaccumulate metals. And some history about that evolution, nature's done forever. So good to remember, microremediation is applied biodegradation and applied accumulation, but it is the way that Earth has worked. Um, and somehow in the 1970s, humans decided, boy, we should start cleaning up some of our pollutants. That was pretty good. And uh, a bunch of laws thereafter, the Clean Water Act and the Comprehensive Environmental Response Compensation Liability Act were all motivations for people to start studying microremediation. And as you can see again, this graph right around uh, the late 80s, people really started paying attention to uh, bioremediation. And here's a nice timeline. So if you can remember way back then, you can look at the left and see Earth begins 4.5 billion years ago. And fungi are speculated to have appeared 800 to 1,000 million years ago. And those are uh, numbers that have changed a lot, but they have quite a ripe history. Uh, land plants appear sometime thereafter. There's actually some speculation about the uh, coevolution of land plants, specifically ferns and lichens, if you will call them. They're fungi, but they have a photobiont um, that may place that land plant appearing a little earlier. Um, and then there's some great extinctions, and I'll show you why that's on here. Uh, 66 million years ago, something happened that left this big old line in the evolutionary record in the soil column. Um, this was the product of a asteroid hitting Earth or meteorite, I think, hitting Earth. I can never recall which one of those is which. And hitting Earth was such a force that it lit the entire subcontinent of India on fire and it shot a pillar of flames halfway to the moon. And left this nice band for us to see as well. And what this band is, is a layer of fungi, a layer of, of evidence of fungi, rather. So after that asteroid or meteor or comet, which I ought to know, it's probably in this text somewhere, hit the earth, fungi inherited the job of cleaning it up. And I want to illustrate to you that microremediation is not something to be thought of as a human creation. Uh, claiming ownership of it would be like claiming ownership over photosynthesis. This is how our planet works. Um, when there are large mass extinction events, there are almost always huge shifts in the fungi and the fungal populations. And after, so in this line here, that black soot is composed of a ton of fungal spores. They inherited the earth and a zoom in closer of what fungi in that kind of uh, um, soil record would look like. And I guess it's, is it a mineral record, fossil record? I study fungus, not geology. Um, you can see on these pictures here, some fungal hyphae weaving their way through um, Rhiny chert. And then on the right, that's some fungi in amber. So paleomycology is a field, surprisingly. Um, and once again, we can look at the history record to understand why microremediation is a thing we're studying now. 
Uh, you can look towards the Carboniferous there, and that was the origin of our buscular mycorrhizae. And the first evidence of basidiomites, which are your guild mushrooms, generally speaking. And they are the ones doing most of the microremediation industrially. And, and you can look also and see the in the Triassic, the emergence of brown rot fungi. And they play an interesting role um, in the forest ecology that I'll illustrate a little bit here. But um, what's neat to note is the evolution of fungi follows the evolution of plants. And as you have many, many lineages of woody plants evolving, many, many lineages of wood decaying fungi evolve. And uh, it's common sense, but it's still worth saying and noting and appreciating. So the different types of rots there, when I say brown rot and you go, guy, that's just rot, I don't know what that means. Brown rot removes most of the carbohydrates and the lignin remains. So if you're out in the woods and you see nice cubicle rot, that rot is most likely the product of some brown rot. And so white rot is um, when all of the components are broken down. And that is like that train wrecker mushroom we mentioned, that'll break down and eat your entire log over, um, over a de couple decades. Soft rot is something to consider too. There are ascomycotins, which can be thought of as bioremediators. Um, and then there's a woman out of uh, Portland who studied them for quite a while and has shown some good promise. She actually just surveyed Superfund sites and found that ascomycotins were already there doing the work. Um, they don't typically do this work as robustly as the basidiomycotins. Um, and to be frank, they're not a group of fungi that I've studied a lot in this context. And when you think of brown rot fungi and wood decay in general, it's easy to think that their game plan is to get food, to break down wood, that's, that's what they're doing. Um, but with brown rot fungi, there's an interesting ecology. And I'd like for you to think of them more as symbionts to the forest ecosystem. Certainly there are fungi which will ravage forests, but there are also fungi that make this brown rot, which then creates very symbiotic pro products to the forest ecosystem. So brown cubicle rot uh, has incredible carbon and moisture retention. And I learned from a very eccentric mycologist named Larry Evans that the presence of brown rot is essential for the preservation of forests during fires. So what we're using now to break down oil or to suck lead out of a polluted soil column might be doing so because at one point, it was leaving a product that helped sustain the forest, thus it still had a place to live. The brown rot gets buried, holds a lot of moisture, and if a fire comes in contact, sweeping over the land to an area where the, this buried brown cubicle rot is, it's coming in contact with cooler, more moist environments. So a patchy distribution of brown cubicle rot is very important to a foil e folk forest ecosystem. Um, I bring that up just to illustrate, this is something we're looking at at the tail end. We're, we're thinking now at, after millions of years of evolution, oh boy, fungi can degrade things, what can we do with them? And I'm guilty of that. It's exciting to think we could use fungi to solve some of our problems, but it's idealistic to forget that there is more to their ecology than what we want them to do. And so the questions I ask now, how is it that we are still so shocked by microremediation? If this is the only way our planet has evolved to break down its waste, or the biggest way, and when you think of a forest, it's only there because there is something sustaining the degradation of the wood. How are we so surprised? It's because there's a huge cultural gap. You know, we don't know, we don't think about fungi on the day to day. We don't see them unless they're fruiting. How do we address that cultural gap? And where will fungi really shine in bioremediation? That, these questions lead me to those small solutions in the home, in small business setups, I think there is a great promise for people to be able to incorporate fungi in meaningful ways. And uh, the more we learn about them, 
uh, maybe change some of the gross slimy names, you know, mold. Uh, we didn't really give them the best names for us to think about it. But the more we learn about them, the better a chance we have at uh, elucidating that ecology and having microremediation be something that is more commonplace. And on that note, the people who've spread the word, uh, Stamets, Peter McCoy, and Trad Cotter, uh, they're absolutely pioneers in the cultural awareness. I wouldn't be doing this if I hadn't got mycelium running as a younger man. And in a field where there's so many people in labs and very few people advocating for that research and advocating for the fungi, um, I don't mean, to, I don't want to paint a picture of them as foolish when I say that we uh, forget the fungal ecology. What I want to make sure we know is um, it's very useful what they did, bridging the gap between the science and the public. And they did a lot of science too. Um, but now that we have a bit more public awareness, we should sh start shifting uh, our attitude less towards what can we get out of this and more of how can we learn to cultivate fungus in meaningful ways. Um, and on the bottom right, that's a great, really specific, simple book by Trad Cotter. If you're looking for a one-off book to buy on microremediation, that's the one I would recommend. Uh, Mycelium Running, if you're looking to maybe do a little bit of cultivation and get a lot of information about all of the possibilities that fungi might have in the future, I'd look there. Um, there's good science in there as well. There definitely is. Uh, uh, it, it sometimes just mentions a lot. So it's easier to work with uh, Trad Cotter's book, I, I think. Radical Mycology is a wonderful, huge tome of a book. And if you're all in it, all the way devoted to learning about uh, how to cultivate fungi in numerous ways, I would recommend that book. Let me see if there's any questions. There is not. Does anybody have any questions at this point? Anything come to mind? I have a question. Sure. Hey, Jeff. Hey, um, I'm just curious. Do you know if anyone has sampled naturally occurring areas with oil, like crude oil in the ocean or under the crust and found naturally occurring fungi in those kinds of environments? I am not aware of any in the ocean. In the ocean, people have discovered dozens of bacterial species um, in the, what's the name of the forest to the east of Seattle? Snoqualmie National Forest. There was found out to be a whole bunch of toxic waste dumped. And it was kind of a bit of a, uh, it, was, it made news. People found out there was waste being dumped there. And there was surveying of those areas for fungi. And they were able to see that of the 80 or 90 documented basidiomites there before, uh, about 12 or 15, I think, stuck around. And so the people have isolated strains of Hyphaloma fasciculare from there. There has been a good amount of bioprospecting uh, on land, uh, but in the ocean, I have not heard of anything. Or underneath the crust, because there are fungi in the ocean crust. That's an interesting thought. And I have, have a another question. question. Yeah, oh, go I'm ahead. Sorry. So you were talking about how brown rot is essential to the forest during fires and how it gets buried and holds moisture. Uh, can you elaborate more on that? I was really curious about that point. Um, so when you mean like how it's essential, like the moisture, it like drops the temperature or make it prevents fire, fire from spreading or what do you mean by that? Yeah, thanks for that question. I think I may have glazed over an important uh, point in that. Um, what I mean is the brown rot degrades the wood in such a way as to leave a uh, very novel form of wood. And that's called brown cubicle wood, brown cubicle rot. And that form of wood holds, I can't remember how many times more, but it's at least three times, five times more water in it. It holds much more carbon. So it functions as a carbon sink and as a moisture retention sink. And that helps create little microclimates inside of the, the soil and in the forest ecosystem. And so what I was uh, meaning to say is that if a fire is passing through an area and for decades, everyone has pulled out all of the wood, there will be less brown cubicle rot buried. 
And if you've left all the wood and the forest is intact, that fire will encounter moist, cold areas and prevent the fire from spreading as rapidly and quickly. If I might jump in here, the uh, brown rotted wood residue is basically the humus that forms, the organic humus that forms soil from the mineral. And it, you have to have mineral and organic both to have soil. So, you know, you think about dumping compost in your garden, that's basically what the lignin, uh, the wood decomposers are doing is they're turning old trees into humus for the soil. And that's the organic content that holds the water that keeps the soil moist so it doesn't burn so fast. Thanks, Regina. Um, we have a couple more questions. Has anyone used micromediation at sites like Hanford? Um, so I'm pretty sure Hanford is a super fun site and there have been people who have surveyed it. Uh, the rules for doing research at super fun sites are kind of tricky. Uh, people don't want uh, people going there because it's a toxic area especially when it deals with radiation. Um, and so I am not aware myself of any trials, but I would be surprised if there haven't been some bioremediation trials. I don't know about microremediation there, so I, I'm not exactly sure. Um, that's a good question. Are there any studies connecting the fungi tree relation? That is putting fungi and trees together to clean up sites. Absolutely. Um, a synergistic approach is the way to go. Um, people have, I'll get to that a little more on here, but I will speak to your question more specifically than Kirsten. That's a good question. Uh, Linda, since they say people have PFAs in their bodies, how can fungi also help remediate that condition? Also, PFAs are in firefighting retardants. They dump those all over the wildfires in the West. Does that mean mushroom collectors shouldn't be collecting mushrooms where they've been fighting wildfires? So. Uh, PFAs are no longer allowed to be in firefighting foam in Washington state, is my awareness of this. Um, there are only a handful of states that have tight regulations on them, one of them being Washington, another being California, if anyone is tuning in from there. And the regulations that are in place are extremely stringent. But as far as the PFAs being in our blood, uh, microremediation is nothing to be thought of and to remediate that. I'm not sure how PFAs are supposed to get out of the blood. Um, for those of you who, who don't know, I'll talk a little bit about this slide and then keep on the question. So a place fungi could really shine are with these PFAS compounds. They are so toxic that they are regulated in parts per trillion, rather parts than parts per billion like heavy metals are. Um, they're forever chemicals. So if you're, uh, you know, if you're paranoid about anything going on with the government or the world right now, um, I would advise looking into this because I, I think there's a lot of places people are worrying about that don't deserve the worry, uh, but this is one that deserves some worry. Um, fungi have the ability to break down PFAS compounds, albeit not in the tiniest concentrations. Like if we're looking at a hundred parts per trillion and we're looking to get down to 14 parts per trillion, fungi won't be able to do that but they will be able to get things down at a couple orders of magnitude. Um, they seem to be able to tolerate it more than bacteria, and they seem to be able to have enzymes to deal with them more. And those are dehalogenating enzymes uh, when then compared to um, other life forms. And they are absolutely, absolutely toxic. And they're in plastics a lot of the time, and they uh, include compounds that can increase cell permeability and allow things to enter in and out of the cell willy-nilly, which you don't want. Um, I can't recall the name of the movie. It's The Devil We Already Knew or The Devil We Now Know or something. But if you type in PFAS movie, The Devil or something, you'll get it. There's an interesting film detailing the history of these. Um, and someone has commented there, that there have been a plan, some, some government, something or other launching, launching a plan to combat PFAS pollution. Yeah, it's very odd. The reason why people have debated whether or not to regulate PFAS compounds is because it's so difficult to prove that they're toxic because they're in everyone's blood. Um, the largest uh, 
class action lawsuit in history happened with PFAS compounds and it required that size to prove they were toxic. Um, and in government, uh, the reason why we're just now seeing regulation is because this stuff is in dental floss, cheap dental floss. It used to be inside popcorn bags. It's in flame retardant clothing, furniture, shampoos used to clean carpets. And so the, what it looked like in government was people saying, um, these people want us to regulate dental floss and popcorn. They're crazy, you know? So it took them a while to get past that rebuttal because there are a lot of things that will change. But anyways, fungi might be the, the one kicker. They might really be able to uh, shine when it comes to remediating these substances. Went off a bit of tangent there, but uh, it's exciting. I, when I interviewed people for that National Science Foundation program, every single one that I asked them, where do you think the field's going? Of, of bioremediation. Every single one said, well, people got to figure out how to break down PFAS. And if that's the case, you know it's, uh, it's going to be something you're hearing about more and more in the news. So envisioning a future for bioremediation following Howard, Howard, Howard Sprouse, and he owns a company called The Remediators. And to speak to your point, uh, question, Kirsten, he started his company with a bunch of graduate students from Stanford. And what they worked on is combinations of plants, fungi, and biochar, which is a very special form of carbon that will be the best for a sustainable long-term cleanup. Because a lot of times you'll put fungi into a very polluted environment, maybe say 15% oil, and they survive for a little bit, but then they die. And the long-term survive or the, the survival is just as important as the breakdown. And fungi are winning out in that environment over plants in a lot of ways. Uh, there are plants that tolerate very high concentrations of metals, but uh, to your point, Kirsten, they would do successive operations of bioremediation where first they plant a bunch of willow sap. A year later, they plant a bunch of clover. A year later, they bring in a bunch of hyphaloma or pleurotus. And that combination with buried biochar seems to be the most successful um, microremediation operation that I know of. And it's a bioremediation effort. Uh, the synergistic approaches are winning out. And it goes to show that uh, fungi aren't the only answer. Jeff Johnston linked the movie there. The 2019 movie on PFAS is called Dark Waters. Thank you. That's a very, uh, it's a creepy one. Watch it when you're okay with getting a little creeped out. Um, and more on to the future of this field. Uh, I do think that omics-based approaches, so that's when you sample a bunch of genetic information in the soil or, and inside the fungi. I think if we build databases um, with experiments that are already going out on, out, already going on out there, uh, we could start to really learn a bit more um, and start to make recipes like McCoy has described and I have a picture of a zebrafish there because the end product of my NSF program was learning that one, the people who are doing bioremediation almost always need a lot more proof and don't wanna spend very much money on research. And so in industry, it's staying in the two th early 2000s, the techniques, but in research, things have taken off to a near sci-fi level. Uh, zebrafish, as pictured there, have all of the major pathways uh, that humans do. And so they're used as model organisms in toxicology. And I wanted to do an omics-based approach. And it turns out the Superfund Research site in Portland is already doing this. They will take soil samples over time at a remediation site, put those soil samples in tanks with zebrafish, and then measure very, very small changes in how the zebrafish is responding to the toxins. And that's very important because these compounds, they might not be a one compound spill, you know, there very few spills are. It might have, you might have six different pollutants in one site. And as they break down, they form 20 different pollutants as things break down and recombine. Uh, and long story short, the industry has stayed a bit behind but the sciences is taking off. Um, and here's a little bit of flim flam, just to break down some of the things that if you take away from this talk, 
if you, if you say, I heard a great talk on micromediation and somebody greets you with skepticism, let them know that you learned there was flim flam. Uh, again, 2% concentration, it seems to be the sweet spot for healthy pleurotus growth in oil. Um, there have been case studies where it'll be higher, but uh, generally I, I don't think that you should imagine just fungi growing straight on oil. Uh, salt water is not their turf. Paul Stamets cultivated a strain of pleurotus to uh, grow on salt water. And I interviewed people at sites that he tried to clean up in salt water and uh, all across the board in industry, salt water remediation with fungi did not work. Uh, or if it worked, it was very minimal. Um, and so we're talking freshwater situations or almost always soil. And uh, again, to the question Kirsten asked about integrating trees, fungi alone is not the answer. And it shouldn't be. You know, they didn't evolve to break things down in isolation. So we shouldn't ask them to do it in isolation. Instead, there are, you know, synergistic approaches with plants and even people who use insects. As the insects eat and carry away pollutants at a site, they carry the pollutants away in minuscule concentrations. And in that way, spread things out in a very uh, low concentration way. Um, that's a niche, niche uh, um, mechanism, but it's called entomo remediation or something of the sort. And uh, in many situations, we don't want micro-remediation. The thought of having big micro-booms to capture oil out on water, if there's water on the ocean, I want somebody scooping it up immediately. I don't want it sitting there. You know, this is micro-remediation should be thought of as an application when there is time and it's not going to actively, quickly affect people around it. Um, and that's another part of the reason why uh, natives have taken quickly to using this and being candidates to experiment with it is um, they're far, a lot of the tribal lands are far removed from places they could scoop things out and bring it to. Um, but yeah, this is some of the flim flam, some of the flim flam. Uh, some of the promising research that makes me think we are not without reason to be excited about microremediation is people are now able to look at enzymes, every enzyme the fungus secretes over 90 days and see how it changes. This particular example is with a mold um, that was a human pathogen, I believe, but uh, it's been done with white rot fungi as well. And I just couldn't dig up that article from my giant uh, <laughs> folder of resources. Um, but if we're able to start documenting all of the enzymes out there, we're able to start imagining that we could build a library of um, uh, a timeline library of, of failure and success at microremediation sites. Um, another, another promising area is research into plant endophytes. And that's a photo I took from the inside of a salal leaf. Um, Fungal endophytes have seemed to play a big role in drought and stress resilience in plants. We're learning that it might be attributed more so to the viruses they carry. It's kind of the matrix there, it goes too deep. But they also are definitely known to devolatilize heavy metals and break down certain compact compounds. And the microbiomes of fungi and plants are essential to understand if we're going to understand uh, microremediation in any way. Uh, for instance, the clover I mentioned earlier, it, it's not the best plant for absorbing heavy metals. That's what it's used for. But it has rhizobia bacteria, as do many members of Fabiaceae. And the, those rhizobia allow it to live much more healthily in polluted areas. Uh, so the better we learn about plant endophytes and bacterial associations, I think we're going to be on, on track to maybe seeing some of these technologies take off. Um, I'm getting to the end here, so I'm just giving you a couple of the oddballs. Uh, the first patent in micro or bioremediation was a man who discovered that if you pump molasses into the ground, it will stimulate the bacteria there and they will clean things up. Um, I met the man, or I talked to the man's son, who still owns a bioremediation company, and he was very proud of that tidbit, but he made sure to tell me that the end product of molasses being digested 
is some sulfurous products. And so it's not the most ideal thing to use anymore. Um, some people have engineered magnetic bacteria uh, to be used in heavy metal bioremediation. So uh, you can apply a magnetic field and basically build clumps of heavy metals and magnetotactic bacteria. These are bacteria that have a, a uh, bunch of magnetic pieces in them. And you can see that line in there. That's a, uh, a line of iron containing molecules. And you can apply a magnetic field and have them move around. Um, it can also possibly aid in the homogenization of soils. Uh, this one was a very wonderfully strange and sad thing I learned. Uh, a man from University of Arizona had set up a uh, research project that looked really promising. He was going to use a molecule called cyclodextrin to deliver enzymes to deep, deep sites of pollution. Say there's pollution 20 feet down, nothing can get to it. He wanted to, just like uh, cyclodextrin is also used in uh, time controlled drug release. You know, if you take a, a pill that releases throughout the day in your body, that's a cyclodextrin capsule that is releasing molecules over the day. Uh, he almost got to the point where he was about to apply his research. And then in 1998, Febreze was invented. And Febreze, Febreze uses cyclodextrin to lock away odors. As you can see here, it's a barrel shaped molecule that literally holds things inside of it. And uh, the price of cyclodextrin overnight went up about 100%, or uh, 100 times, I mean, and his research project was out of funding. So that's a, a sad one, kind of fun. And let's see, what uh, do we have next? Topics of research I'd like to pursue. Um, I think if I could sum these up, I want to look for the simplest way to evaluate what might be useful for bioremediation and the most complex computerized way. And I don't know which one of these, if any, I will get to study in a next degree, but um, it's been found in the, the picture in the top left shows something called uh, membraneless organelles. And it's been found that fungi will have these tiny organelles that uh, so if you are not into cellular biology, an organelle is what it sounds like. It's a little organ inside a cell. And if fungi are put under stress, uh, reproducibly, they will produce, like, oh, many times it's been documented, little membraneless organelles that signify stress is going on in the cell. And there are many different types. The function of all of them is not known, but it's fathomable to think that we could look at fungal candidates for microremediation and see if they form these membraneless organelles and look for fungi that through that mechanism are more resistant to stress or have different mechanisms to deal with stress. And an awesome, oh, I just started saying out loud the question or the comment I was reading. Thanks, Diana. Um, another, the other, area of research I'm interested in is an integrated omic approach uh, where we would, as I've mentioned a few times, start to build a library of uh, microremediation sites. And I don't think it's something that humans will be able to interpret. I think that it's a massive amount of data that if people start to collect, um, it will take a lot of intelligent computer algorithms to decipher. Uh, however, we use algorithms like that for drug discovery, and other pieces of biology. It's in our smartphones. AI is good at, at learning situations. And I think if we give enough information to a uh, very carefully designed AI, there, there's a chance that we could start to build at least some sort of recipes. And uh, a final note here with the word clean up accidentally blopped up a little bit there. Do not mistake clean new for a solution. So just asterisk to this whole presentation. The issue is people polluting. The issue is not us having a way to clean it up. We shouldn't have to find ways to clean things up. This is a Band-Aid. If we succeed, if we don't, we are working in the industry of Band-Aids. We need the Band-Aid. 
Um, there is, as I showed you earlier, 1,300 sites in our country that are absolutely toxified and 450,000 more that are uh, in need of work. Um, but more urgent than that work is we need people to stop polluting. So uh, make sure you keep that in mind as well. If, if this topic comes up again in conversation, um, we need to think about who's making the mess. So with that, I'll take any questions. Thanks for sticking around. I know that was a lot, but I hope you enjoyed it. I have a question. Sure thing. So really early on in your lecture, you had this really cool photo of nematodes that were like entwined with mycelium and you even made a comment like gee i wish i had uh given credit on this that's a cool photo i really want to know more about it and i would like a copy of it um and who took that photo yeah i'll find that for you um cool. those there's a whole bunch of different mechanisms that fungi catch nematodes and ntfs is what you'll uh find online they're called nematode trapping fungi some make loops some, uh, I think, attract the nematodes with chemicals, other mechanisms I don't know about. But yeah, I can get that to you. Rad, thanks. Sure thing. You're welcome, Daves. And thanks for tuning in. That's all I got. And I, uh, if there aren't any more questions, um, yeah, sure thing. Sure thing. Um, Hope you enjoyed. I'll turn it back over to the host. Very interesting. Glad you enjoyed. Thank you. How do I stop the, stop the screen share? There you go. <laughs> OK. Lauren, do you have anything you want to say? Hi, guys. Hi. There's a rebound. Thank you so much for coming tonight. So that's all I have to say. And thank you, Jack, for presenting. Yeah, thank you, Jack. That was that was like so much food for thought.